Crashes are what people click on. The drama, the risk, the chaos. It's the stuff that makes extreme sports addictive to watch. These moments drive attention. They always have. From gladiators in the arena to racing cars in the rain, to sail GP boats pushing the limit. But the goal is never to have somebody get badly hurt. Sail GP is now hitting higher speeds than ever before. These boats are racing consistently over 100 kilometers per hour. It's a mix of rising skill level across a fleet and constant technological innovation. With new designs, new tech and new teams, the sport keeps evolving. And so do the tools being developed to reduce risk, even predicting and preventing crashes before they happen. That was so close. As the boats get faster and the racing gets tighter, safety systems are being reviewed and adapted all the time, giving athletes more stability, more control and the confidence to keep pushing. So the real question is, how do you keep all of the action without compromising safety? It starts with this, impact vests and helmets every sail GP athlete has to wear. These vests are designed to absorb the force and disperse the impact on the athletes. Not long ago, one of these made the difference in a huge collision. It absorbed the hit and that sailor walked away with minimal injuries. Impact vests can reduce the force on the body, helping prevent broken ribs and internal injuries. But it's not just the vest, it's the equipment, the safety systems built into the boat and the training and skill of the athletes. But how do the athletes use this all when things go wrong? Well, to find out, we're heading to safety training and I'm bringing a willing volunteer. This is Alex, our guinea pig for today. And this is Simon, the on-water safety lead. Simon is gonna be taking Alex through the same on-water safety training that every sail duty athlete has to pass. All your safety equipment is always down your right hand side. Yeah. Okay. This is a this is a normal climbing harness and it's been adapted by Cell GP to, to work on the F50. And the thing that we've actually added onto here is this spreader bar. These boats are doing two and a half G's. So if you're getting pulled at you know two and a half G's, that's an awful lot of load. So we want to try and spread that through your waist. Sure. This is part of your tether release system. The idea of this quick release system is to be able to release yourself from the yacht without having to unclip it here because that Harness might be there. Okay. Your PFDs. What does PFD stand for? Personal flotation device. Okay. So we're now looking at this sort of emergency stuff down your right hand side. You've got your air at the top, okay? Working your way down, you'll find a bobble. That bobble is attached to a safety knife. If you pull that out, you've got a very sharp, very sharp knife, okay? And your next thing, as you go down a little bit more, we've got that release system. Okay. okay? I want the, your right hand to find this little hole here, okay? And with your other hand, I want you to pull that rope away. That's okay. it. That's your muscle memory. This is a, called an EBS system. It's a, it's a bottle designed by Aqualung and Apex, okay? This will give you approximately two to two and a half minutes of air, depending on your mindset, okay? Oh. If you can just breathe calmly, despite what's going on around you, this bottle will last longer. Okay. If you panic and start flapping around, you're going to suck through this bottle much quicker. And so the first thing we encourage you to do is when we, when we, when, when you finally do get yourself into this air, is to give yourself two sanity rescue breaths. So your air, what we encourage you to do is simply take that, give it a good old yank as far as it can go, and then slap it in your mouth. Okay. So have a go at that now. And then your first thing is out. Whenever we're doing these drills now, whenever you put your air in your mouth, you automatically go down that right hand side and look to release, okay? okay? Everything you do, up, in, two breaths, down, release. And we're gonna do this a couple of times. So this is our next drill here. So we're gonna, we're gonna brace, brace, brace. We're gonna get you down as low as you can go, okay? And I want you to get that air out, in, I want you to breathe out first, and then you can take the reg out of your mouth if you like, take those two deep breaths, all right? And then I want to look for that release of your strop. Here we go, feeling comfortable? Yep. Reset, good, excellent. So brace, 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 down, up, in. You ready for the water? No, but I think we're gonna have to just get it done. Yeah, we're we? gonna have to get it done. Right, how do you want me in like that? Just 
nice and easy. Just nice and easy. There you go. Graceful. Exactly how a capsize will go there down. There you go. So let's get used to how boring you are and what, what's going on around you. Right, here we go. So first thing, you're gonna put out your mouth just like you did before. I want you to start breathing it and then start and then put your head underwater. Just put your head underwater. That's it, just like that. That's what we're feeling. It is. You've got to work hard on it. Pitch black there. Well, you've also got your eyes closed. <laughs> oh, yeah. Remember your drill. Put it all the way out and then look to try and release. So this time, I'm just going to hold you back. So just remember. Yeah. You're getting your air in and then you're looking yeah. at trying to release that. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to try. I'm going to be pulling on that okay. just, to, just nice. to help you uh, remember it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. You ready? Happy? So yep. brace, brace, brace. Here we go. Nice oh. work. Step now, one. The clearest way you could turn to your okay is putting your hand on your head. If you're not okay, it's a big wave. Okay. All right? If you don't do anything at all, we're going to assume you're not okay. All right? Yeah. And we're coming in. And is that universal? Even if their boat doesn't capsize, I saw the Brazilian team doing it. Is everyone okay? Is everyone okay? Yeah, we're right. all okay. Because what <laughs> we're going to do now, we're going to get you out. Okay? Oh, no. This time, you're going to jump it. And it means yeah. you're going to go underwater a little bit more. And I'm not going to let you back up. Now, for some athletes, we'll get to do a whole lot of burpees to start with just to get their heart rate up. But I have a funny feeling your heart rate's already high enough. <laughs> yeah, it's up there. <laughs> so we're probably, it's up we there. probably won't have to do that. Okay, so remember your drill. So brace, brace, brace in your cup. Wearing full kit, the first step is getting the respirator. If you don't get that right, you right. don't have time to think about anything else. Step two is the sanity breath. One big inhale to force yourself to relax even when every instinct is telling you to rush. Step three, unclip. Free yourself from the boat before you can think about the surface. Step four, get clear and make your way up, calmly but fast. Step five, hand on head, that signal that you've made it out safely. Nice work. Yeah. He did it. That was awesome. Nice work. What an experience. Well, well done. What was the hardest part, remembering the steps or staying calm? Staying calm, for sure. When I first got in, I thought, I'm not going to be able to do this. I tried just even just breathing through this with my head in the water. And I was just weighing out the options in my head, like how do I say that I don't want to do it? Um, but then once well, Simon spoke me through it and I started going through, I think when you have no other option than to do it and you just, you just kind of get on with it and your mind kicks in. But when I was just trying to go through the steps before I was put under pressure, it was really difficult. Um, and the hardest thing is always to remember to actually take the clip off. Yeah. As you might have seen on the last one, you kept pulling on it and I was like, oh, right. Yeah, so never again though, probably, hopefully, fingers crossed. This drill replicates the chaos of a real capsize. Athletes learn the trust of the equipment, the steps become instinct, and they can get to the surface fast in an emergency. But training is just one layer of safety. The F50 itself is designed with safety built in, and that's where we're heading next. These F50s have inbuilt safety features. There's four knives here, 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 and here. There's plenty of G-forces on the F50, so these tether systems are to make sure the athletes don't fall off the boat, so that if they do go flying off, they get caught by their tether and don't end up in the water. And two canisters of spare air on each side of the boat in case they run out on the air on their body or they need to help one of their teammates. Safety isn't just gear and training. It's built into the F50 itself. Every feature is designed to prepare the crew for the worst case scenario and give them options if something goes wrong. From extra knives to spare air bottles, the goal is to give athletes precious seconds. The time they need to get clear and stay safe before the safety boat arrives. But it's not only what you can see on deck. A huge amount of safety is built into the engineering and software. The technology that makes these boats more stable, more predictable and less likely to crash in the first place. Hey Alex, how are you? Good, good, and you? Good, good. I, I feel you're the you're the man with all the answers when it comes to technology. So uh, thanks for your time. No worries. This is Alex Reed, SailGP's director of performance engineering. Alex and his team are behind several key safety innovations on the F50. Um, I guess I was just wondering, in terms of keeping the F50s safe, keeping the athletes safe out there, what role does technology really have in, you know? making sure that the boats can still go as fast, but every, everyone's kept safe. 
you know, the best thing to do really in terms of keeping people safe is to avoid boats coming together. So we've got uh, a lot of software that runs locally on the boats and on the clouds, which basically warns uh, warns the teams when things are getting close. You know, we, we try and keep the boats apart, but when they do get close together, there are things, designs you know, on the boat that will help. The tips on the HSB2s and the LAV2s are sacrificial. So they're, they're designed to break off rather than gouge through the carbon. Yeah, so on that sort of anti-collision software that you touched on, in terms of like seeing it, that data is on the wing screen. Is that how the athletes know it? And what, do they see a picture of the other boat or does it flash up? Yeah, yeah. Um, so they, yeah, each team's got a, a wing screen uh, and on there they can see their own boat. It guides them around the course. But also they get to see um, all the other boats. So um, they appear as kind of from a distance, I guess little dots. Um, and you can see, you know, where the trajectories of the boats are. Basically, when you start to get close or, you know, within a collision course of, of another boat, you'll get an alarm that will flash up telling you which boat you're, you're on course for. They're not, they're not doing anything, they're not doing anything. Down two, down five, down five, down five, down ten. Oh, so if there's a blind spot that the strategist or the driver can't see, they can look at the wing screen to kind of give them an indication and that's when we see the strategist run across just to maybe double check with their eyes. You know, they rely on the software, but you know, you'll see every now and then somebody might, you know, the strategist might run, run and briefly glance to it if it's quite complex. How much of, I guess, all of the safety things that you're implementing, I guess, are to, to keep the boats apart or are you talking to the sailors and innovating in the moment? Yeah, so a bit of both really. Um, so we're always, you know, as engineers, we're, I guess, maybe slightly pessimistic and always thinking about what, what's the worst thing that can happen. Um, and we, you know, when we develop things, we, we try and cover those scenarios, but we don't, you know, we don't always get it right. And we have a really good relationship with the sailors and, you know, that typically, you know, those guys and, uh, and girls will come up with some really good ideas. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. It was great to get an insight into all the technology behind the F50 that we don't really see, um, but keeps, I guess, the boats going super quick, super fast, but everyone's safe at the same time. Titanium T-foils help keep the F50 stable in flight. Anti-collision software gives crews real-time alerts to avoid dangerous moments. And new rudders and rake software are making cavitation and structural risks less likely allowing athletes to race harder with more control at higher speeds than ever before. So the tech is there to keep everyone safer, but what is it actually like to be on board racing at speeds up to 100 kilometers per hour? Time to hear from someone who's been there. Tom, how physically intense is it to sail an F50 out there? Oh, for sure it's very physically intense. They're hard boats to sail, there's a lot of G-forces. If you have a nose dive, there's a lot of high water impact on you. Like it's, the water feels like concrete when, you, uh, when, you, when it hits you at these speeds. So as time's gone on, we've had to adapt with our safety measures to, to stay with the current and keep ourselves safe on board. And when it does get chaotic like that, how do you and the team sort of handle those you know, high pressure, high risk environments? As a competitive sailor and a racer, I, I want to push as much as I possibly can and whatever the boat's capable of taking, I want to take it to that limit. But if you push a situation and you crash and you injure three guys and they're out for the season, that's the end of your, your year. So there's times when you've got to push and there's times when you've got to take your foot off the accelerator a little. And obviously on an F50, it, it's hard to sort of back off, as you said. How do you do that? Is that slowing the boat down, not putting yourself in vulnerable positions? What, what sort of things, tools do you have sort of as a driver to do that? It's really about not putting yourself in a dangerous position. Sometimes you're coming into a mark, there's three or four boats pushing for that spot, the inside position, but if we don't get it right, we could crash into another boat. A lot of that's experience, understanding each situation and knowing when to push and when to back off. And beyond that, obviously, you have equipment on the boat, on you, you have training, and there's also safety systems built into the F50. How has that sort of evolved from when, you know, you first stepped on a foiling catamaran like this? And when I first jumped on a foiling catamaran, I was right at the coal face when we were just learning. And I can tell you it was a lot more scary than it is today. We didn't know what we were doing. We basically put these bits of carbon on the bottom of these straight foils and just said, okay, we didn't have impact vests, we didn't have knives, we didn't have helmets, we didn't have spare air bottles, we didn't have any of that stuff. So now everyone's harnessed to the boat, they can't fall off 
and it's a much safer game now that we're playing than we were. And with all those sort of features, I guess, does that give you the confidence to sort of push the boat more than before? I think naturally you start pushing the boat a bit more when you know that you can't physically fall off the boat. Um, you naturally run a bit faster when you're crossing and you run into the with the g-forces a bit more knowing that if you do get it wrong you've got something there to catch you. So obviously there's your experience, there's the safety team at SailGP, we've also got the tech team looking at upgrades they can do to make it safer. How do you sort of all work together to make sure that you know you're, you're pushing the limits out there on the water? For sure everyone has a voice in this process, every driver for sure gets a say we're fortunate Sal GP listen to us, the designers listen to us, and they say, how can we make it better for you guys? With Sal GP, they realize that we're the ones on the boats racing, and they come to us and ask for our opinion. Hey, is this pushing too far? Uh, can we push further in this to keep the boats the high tech, fast, and exciting that we all see? Or, uh, or do we need to back off in certain areas? So it's a really good process. Despite all of this, the gear, the training, and the tech built into the F50, things can still go wrong. And when they do, it's the combined work of the athletes, their equipment, and the safety team that makes the difference. So what happens in those critical moments after a capsize? The safety boat and the medical team are the final layer of protection. Their role is to reach the crew fast, assess the situation, and step in when equipment and training aren't enough. Okay, so what's your first priority when a boat capsizes? First thing we need to do is a head count to make sure everybody's accounted for. Hopefully get the okay sign off all the sailors. And how quickly can you normally get there in the middle of a race? If I'm on the salvage asset, we could be at the other end of the course. So we should be there within 60 seconds, but our safety assets are spread out quite evenly. So if there is an incident, we should be able to hit it within 30 seconds. From the salvage asset, we will transfer them to another medical asset and um, if, the, if the boat's capsized or pitch, in a pitch pole state that, or any sort of damage, then we uh, evolve into a salvage operation and then we try to um, keep the boat safe and try to get it back in one piece. Let's see how a medical extraction plays out. Okay. I've fallen over in a manoeuvre and my bone is sticking out of my leg and I don't know what to do. Hi Lisa, what have you done? I fell over and my leg, it's so sore, I don't know what I've done. Okay, which leg is it? My right leg. Okay, do you have any pain anywhere else? No, it's just my leg. No, okay, safety one, safety one, medic five. Maria's going to apply a vacuum splint to your leg just to support it. Okay. And then we're going to go and get a stretcher. It's going to slide underneath there. We're going to go and get the basket alongside you. Yeah. Are you happy to shuffle over if we support your leg? Yeah. Yeah. Are you ready? Ready. Oh my yeah. God, ready, steady, up. There we go. And then just, down. that's it. Perfect. Who won the race? You won it. Yes. <laughs> worth the pain. Yeah. Yeah. Worth, worth the, the pain. pain. <laughs> you leg. You just get one side each. Yeah. Just let me know when you're good. No, that's it. Just bridge in there. Right, I've got the head end. Okay, ready, set, slide. And then I'll come around. Ready, set, let go. And down we go. Take me to the hospital. <laughs> All of these layers, the gear, the training, the design of the boat and the safety team work together. And that's what lets SailGP athletes push harder than ever before while staying safe. What fans see is speed and spectacle. What they don't see are the safety systems working in the background to keep SailGP athletes safe while they're pushing the limits. That's it for now. For more SailGP behind the scenes content, make sure to hit subscribe and we'll see you for the next one.